Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and today we are talking, as promised, about Plato's Republic. I was just telling Greg and Rachel that in high school, we read certain excerpts from the Republic, and in college, I read different excerpts. And so this was my first time prepping for this podcast. It was the first time that I've actually read it all the way through, which I I, I recommend to a certain extent. <laughs> um, we will get into all of all of the different things. Um, should we start at the very beginning? <laughs> it's a very good place to start. <laughs> you know, when you come when you come to a study of Plato, people want to talk about his ideals, the, the forms, the universals and all, and epistemology generally. And yet the Republic is by far his most famous and important work, and the one that's quoted and referenced and regurgitated in various forms for the next 2,000 years. And it's not, it, it, it touches on those things, the ideal of justice. In fact, supposedly, that's what it's all about. We're looking- it's the inciting question. Out, yeah, the inciting question. Where does justice arrive or arise in a society? And, and is it and better they, than injustice? You know, there's <laughs> that. Um, and, and so as is the way with most of Plato's, we call them dialogues, they're more like trialogues or quadrilogues. A bunch of people are hanging out one afternoon, and they ask someone asks the inciting question, as you say, and they begin to talk. Mostly, uh, Plato has a fictionalized Socrates do the talking, and there are a few people who are stuck in normally more or less to be yes men. Yes, that is true, and certainly without a doubt. The Can there be any other possibility? Into the book, the more you just skip over Glaucon's yeah, I lines. Just, I don't. Like, when I'm reading into my class, I, I like, don't even read that part. This is a monologue uh, yeah. <laughs> interrupted by Glaucon. <laughs> yes. Um, so the, you know that that's the format. If, if some of you have never read it, well, that's what it's like. the The issue becomes the Greek city state, the polis. Where does what what is the nature of justice within the system? And these men say that maybe if they start from scratch, if they do a bit of role playing and build a city in their imaginations, Apollos, city state, that maybe then it will become clear. It's interesting to me, at least, that as they start this, the uh, uh, Plato says, well, the, the, the cities, that's uh, Plato, Socrates, it's the same person. <laughs> if we're the working within the narrative, Socrates. let's use the character names. <laughs> right, fine. Socrates um, says that the city-state has to uh, arise out of human need. A state arises out of the needs of mankind. No one is self-sufficing, but all of us have many wants. Can there be any, be any other origin of a state? Or can any other origin of a state be imagined? No, not uh, whatever the yes man says. Notice, human need. None of us is self-sufficing. We all have wants. And he throws it out there more or less as a rhetorical question. You can't think of any other reason for a state. Uh, well, hmm. God. <laughs> uh, the sovereign triune God who is in himself eternal community and communion, who creates in his image and therefore destines man for communion. Now, you could still say, well, that's a need. Man needs God. But that's not the kind of uh, need he's talking about here. And the state the does not answer want. man's need for God. No, certainly this one doesn't. This is a very thoroughly humanistic approach to the whole thing. But it's not um, It's not individualistic. It's not, I, I bring my self-autonomy and freedom to this deal, and I'm willing to trade a little bit of my liberty for all the things that I want and need. That's not what's going on here, because the further they go in building this thing, the more the individual drifts into the formless mass that is the polis. Mm -hmm. When we talk about utopias, 
Plato's Republic usually is first historically on the list. But as utopias go, it's rather a pathetic one. It does not guarantee peace. In fact, it's assumed that this will be a warrior state, necessarily so, for reasons we'll get to. Uh, It doesn't promise luxury. It, It does promise that the guardians can share all the women around, but only at certain times and under certain conditions, carefully regulated by uh, a created manufactured liturgical calendar. Why does somebody want this exactly? Well, because we need a state, and this one is what Plato with Socrates thinks would fit the bill for mm-hmm. us. And later in the dialogue, uh, we do come to that bluntly stated, yeah. where where the interlocutor says, well, then these people won't be happy. And Socrates says, of course they won't be happy. <laughs> Who said it was about their happiness? It's about the <laughs> happiness of the state. Yes. Um, but since this is a role play, as you say, it's a thought experiment. And Socrates even says at one point, we know this this can never be. This is, this is an ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, how much are we to suppose that Plato is earnest in what he suggests? Well, see, there's the problem, isn't it? Because we don't have Sparks notes from his students to tell us what he said off camera. Mm-hmm. We look at some of the suggestions and say, okay, that went over ridiculously. That's There's there's no way. What? Surely <laughs> really? he couldn't have meant that. That's so no. uncivilized and barbaric. Uh, or just, and no one's going to believe that lie. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, you, you guardians... You actually came forth full blown from the womb of the earth, and all those mm-hmm. things that you remember about childhood and parents, all they illusions. Were a dream. It's all a dream. <laughs> yeah. It's all implanted thoughts. <laughs> Trust us. Mm-hmm. Why? <laughs> That's just abs. And do you really think they're going to believe that? Mm-hmm. It's we almost like a brave new world kind of a thing that he oh, suggests yeah. that without the technology to explain how it could be possible, he's yeah. just sort of fancifully creating this thing that is horrifying to me. (laughs) Uh, In Brave New World, at least we have the predestination chambers where babies are created in test tubes and genetically modified to be content in whatever roles society needs them to fill. This is, uh, if we lie to people enough and manipulate their environment enough and educate them properly, they'll go along with all this. I, I don't really think they will, and we're not sure you're serious. And we can't at this remote remove, we can't be sure. We can't be sure. We don't know to what degree he meant this. But I think we can be pretty sure that a lot of scholars and socialist daydreamers over the past two two thousand years either thought he was serious or just edited out mentally those things that were ridiculous and just yeah, that that was just that was just for fun. But the real part, well, no, that's it goes with it. Um, anyway, we, we, we need to work our way there. So, mm-hmm. uh, without consulting Moses and the prophets or anybody else for that matter, these men set about deciding what things people need, food, dwelling, clothing, stuff like this. And if that's all there is, then we don't need a lot of people. Uh, but when we consider a division of labor, all right, well, let's add a few more people so we don't have to all do everything. Okay, we got some more people going on, um, and and the first um, the first point we come up with: this is a lame society. They 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 need some things to to spice up life, like spices and prostitutes <laughs> and couches, <laughs> as opposed to sitting on rocks. I guess. All right. Well, then I guess. And at this point, Socrates says. Oh, you don't just want a state. You want a state. And he uses the word luxurious Mm -hmm. or a state at fever heat. (laughs) And some sense of excess. Yeah. Uh, And and he recognizes the geographical, geological, agricultural limitations of any place you put your city. No city is going to have everything. You're going, we would say, oh, then trade. His response is, oh, then war. Other people are going to have stuff you want. You need to go take their stuff 
for your stuff, kill people and take their stuff. This is role playing after all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. And, and the Republic then moves to a discussion of the people, at least English translation, he calls guardians. Uh, these are not the common ordinary citizens. These are the people who are the soldiers, the politicians, statesmen, the bureaucrats, the people who run the city and who fight to protect it and preserve it. And, and it's at this point that things begin to get a little weird. <laughs> um, before I go on, Emily, since you're so fresh in your mind, what else comes to your to your mind at this point of things you read? I mean, that is the, the first big uh, subtopic, if you will. As I think we said already, we get here by trying to ask about justice. Mm -hmm. And so Socrates says, well, we need to look at a big scale because it's easier to see at a big scale what right. we're talking about. So the state this whole time is in some sense an analogy or a metaphor for the human soul. Um, so he's constantly yeah. drawing this parallel back and forth between what is an ordered state and what is the analog in the soul. Yeah, that becomes explicit right at the end. Um, and I haven't read enough of it lately, if ever, to to draw out anything along the line. But feel free. Uh, he's He does look at these guardians and he does consider their training for body and soul. He does not depart from traditional Greek models. Uh, there's some things he doesn't say, and we can either assume, well, he's going to follow traditional Greek models then. <laughs> um, well, he which... kind of he pokes at them, right? Because he he says, well, we wouldn't want our our guardians to be brought up on lies mm -hmm. unless they're the lies that we think are good for them. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> which does away with most of Homer. Yeah, Homer and Hesiod go right out the door because mm -hmm. they say things about the gods that Plato and Socrates will not accept. They, they there's there's some argument. Well, they produce they present the gods as um, changeable, and God to be God, the gods to be gods must be immutable. And a number of things like this come out of his conception of what the god or the gods are. He, mm -hmm. does, he some of it is, is there's some quick superficial argument, but there's no treatise on theology, no theology one hundred one. No, here is who or what I believe God or the gods are. He seems what he the things he says could apply to some kind of vague theism or deism. It can just as well apply to polytheism stripped of um, its literary backgrounds. So people can come here with their Christian presuppositions and with the right translation and say, oh, this God person, yeah, he's like the God of the Bible, immutable. Um, and good. Plato and good. He, he's he good. good. He, does, he does that which is good. He does not do evil. But using this rationalized standard, he then begins to point out there, as you say, some things must, there are some lies that must not be told. So we need to get rid of any of the poets, however great they may be, who describe the gods this way. As Christians were kind of, okay, well, we don't really have a problem with this. There goes <laughs> classical education, because we're not starting with Homer anymore, for sure. Um but it goes all the way down to any kind of, of story that even nurses might tell children. Uh, once a god w went out looking for an apple, eh, no, gods don't eat apples, get rid of the nurse. Yep. It's like they don't it's, walk up and down the street. There's there's a very careful removal yeah. of a sense of imminence, which is interesting. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That it, gods cannot be said to take disguises because that would yeah. be deceptive. Mm -hmm. And so you can't say that, oh, you better listen up or, you know, the God that's walking up and down the street will find you. It's like, yeah. oh no, the God would never catch you doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have that thought, can we? No, the gods are far removed. Uh, they cannot appear, manifest themselves in any but their true form. And since their true form is invisible, intangible, and transcendent, yeah, we're 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 right out. God, God appearing as say the angel of the Lord is an impossibility. 
and worse, God taking incarnate form in the person mm. of Jesus Christ is right out. Unthinkable. Yeah, it's it's unthinkable. Why would God do that? And that would be a change according to Plato and Socrates' standard of of reason. So that's out. And and, and the key thing is not simply that he's slicing and dicing theology. He's putting it in the power of the guardians or the people who train the guardians, the guardians behind the guardians, yes. the people who watch the watchers, <laughs> to do the censoring. Mm -hmm. He's handing to the state and the, the super state, the people behind who are training the deep these, state, these rules, the deep will. state. Yeah. The power to censor literature and theology and education in general and anything that might confuse these guardians in the future, give them a misunderstanding of ultimate realities or the nature of God. We mentioned in passing, God is good. Well, if God is good, that which is good does good. It does not do bad. And, and then with a little sight of hand, that means it does not produce any harm. So God is not the source of all things, but only of good things. So God can send nice April showers on your flowers, but the storm that tears your village to pieces, that wasn't God. And the little kitten that comes and visits and stays in front of your children, God may have sent that, but the lion who devours your sons and daughters out in the fields, that wasn't God. Don't blame God for that. God doesn't do those things. And, and we keep going. So by the time we're done, God does not do much. Mm -hmm. God can't do much. Because being good, he is the source of good. And of course, the question, as Christians, we come to immediately, but the, the world has trouble with this, good by whose standards? Uh, as what? the president of my college used to wander around the cafeteria asking students, what is the good? <laughs> <laughs> did, he ever, did they ever respond, this pizza? <laughs> <laughs> they should have. You know, well, maybe the cafeteria maybe was not, not the, Maybe not in the cafeteria, you know. <laughs> Oh, so uh, children must not hear any story, song, music, it's uh, censored. They'll mm. corrupt their moral natures or their yeah. understandings of the God. Homer Even Hesse certain types of harmonies and rhythms are Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's beyond what I usually have my students read. But Plato was uh, touchy about music because the power to disrupt the soul. Uh, and, and Aristotle and um, Plato had different takes on on the power of music and what it could do. Plato was, the, I believe, the one who said, I'll let you write the nation's laws if I can write their music. He understood that there's something there and something that powerful must be regulated by the state. <laughs> so the, we're not talking here a, a, a state where people are free to express themselves, think their own thoughts, do what's best for themselves, find themselves as you said earlier, it's about the good of the state. And although we don't want people lying to the guardians of the state in their youth, well, we don't want other people doing <laughs> it. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, we, we come to the, well, here it is, in my notes at least, Socrates, bordering on the ridiculous, proposes that education, or that educators put forward an audacious life for the good of state, the ruler, the soldiers, and finally the people will be told that what the guardians remember of their youth was all a delusion. It never happened. And they will be told that they were birth shape formed in the bowels of Mother Earth. They emerged full grown, their skills and powers fully developed, and their minds full of false memories. And so the guardians will only care about the land and the state and nothing about family or childhood friends. How many... How many movies, novels, stories, and things hinge upon, wait, you were my childhood friend. I must rescue you from my own people because of this special bond. We None of that's going to happen. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, this kind of fits in. We were watching, um, I always get the letters wrong, NCIS. Mm -hmm. um, the, the crime show. The crime show. Uh, and Mark Harmon's uh, character, um, Leroy Gibbs, Leroy Jethro Gibbs, uh, gets a call from his dad and his dad says, I just got a note from an old friend back from my, from my uh, Air Force days. Well, the Army days, I guess, in those days. Uh, I was flying this plane and, and, and um, 
I lost all sense of where I was. My compass was out. The radio wasn't working. And, and I was, I was gone for it. And this, this guy pulls up beside me in his plane and then leads me out. He saved my life. And now I have this letter from him saying that he's about to die. We must go find him. I need you to meet him. The rest of the, this is actually a secondary plot line, but through the rest of the show, we're left wondering whether uh, Gibbs' dad is sane, mm-hmm. whether or not dementia has not set in, because he's so insistent. It's so important. They get to the man's house. He's not there. There's some reference to an ambulance having picked him up later, but when the team does searches, he's not shown up in any hospital or um, the morgue. There's And they do the background search, and this man never, as far as they can tell, existed in um, Gibbs' father's squadron. He seems to be a complete figment of the imagination, and yet Dad keeps saying, no, no, he's real. You've got to meet him. I know you don't believe me. That's your problem, but you, you need. I'm your father. You should respect me, and this is so important. Why is it important? Once you see him, at the very end, uh, Gibbs confronts his father and says, uh, Dad, he's not. We looked. There was no such man in your squadron. Why did you think he was in my squadron? <laughs> well, what? Well, then who was he? He was on the other side. He was German. You never told me that. You know, I'm sure I did. No, you didn't. Well, that's 100 <laughs> years ago when I told you the story. Who knows what I told you? And so it turns out that he indeed is alive. And the whole thing hinges upon. It's the it's World War II. We we see the memories relived, and finally we're shown the second plane in full. There's a swastika on it as he <laughs> comes up and he guides, gives dad back to safety. And that's why it's so important at that moment, this bond that trans and here's the point that transcends city states. Mm-hmm. That transcends political identities and political ideologies kick in. And they both identified themselves as human beings. And that was more important. And the story goes on from there. That's not going to happen in Plato's Republic. Mm -hmm. There will never be that moment of realization when you understand there's something more important than the state. Not an ideology, not a religion, not a person, not a memory. It's all about the state. And the suggestion is if somehow that slips up, well, we know we're going to go to children who don't fit in. We can assume that um, guardians who are troublemakers might meet a, se- a similar fate. Plato doesn't go there because he doesn't want to admit that his educational system is actually going to fail any point. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the next thing then is that these guardians, and, and the goal here is to get them to identify wholly with the state. So not only can they not have any memories that are uniquely theirs, any past, anything precious to them, the past. They can't have anything in the present because, you know, we fight over our stuff. That's my car. That's my house. That's my library. Um, That's my Rolex. You can't have it. Well, if they don't have these things, nothing to fight over. (laughs) <laughs> All that they have is what they have, which is the state. So let's make them eat the same food, drink the same drink, have their meals in the same place, sleep under the same conditions, no, nothing special. All have the same blankets, all have the same beds, all have the same food. There is no, I have nothing that is uniquely mine that sets me apart from you. And there's a scheme to maintain satisfaction with this situation yes. by flattering them. And say, oh, but your your soul is made of silver and gold. What would you want that pale <laughs> imitation called money for? <laughs> okay. You know, <laughs> I don't, I, remember I don't that know part. a single human being on which that would work, but okay. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, no. Like, what good does this silver and gold in my soul do me if I can't have what I want? <laughs> I, I think what's maybe implied, and there's a lot that has to be implied, is that these people, these guardians grow up in this state. They don't get to see another one. Right. This is it. As far as they're concerned, this is a limitation on mankind. I'm reminded of uh, citizens in the Soviet Union during Cold War Mm -hmm. when they were told, we were starving, we were poor, we were wretched, we had nothing. They lived in paradise. You forget the long lines, forget the substandard quality of everything. They weren't to know it was substandard. They weren't to know 
that they were poor. They didn't. They were told that you're living your life, best life ever. And the, compared to the rest of the world, this is heaven. And therefore, it was very dangerous to let their citizens reach out beyond uh, the boundaries of the Soviet Union. Um, the book I'm, I've been proofing for my friend Landon uh, is simply, so far, an account of groups who came in to, to visit the Soviet Union right, shortly after the revolution and see what the quality of life was. First of all, these people were let in very selectively. Their, where they were going, what they were doing was all planned out in advance. No last minute, hey, can we go see that? No. It was more, it was more like, um, mm -hmm. they're closed today. How about tomorrow? They're closed then too. The day after, it's a special holiday for workers. You know, it just, they're not allowed. To, and, and if people accidentally came up and bumped into the, the foreign visitors, it could get you sent to prison for years just having an interaction with someone from the outside. Um, one interesting um, side benefit of this, um, a man named George Bailey in a book called Armageddon Now, I'm sorry, Armageddon in Prime Time, uh, argues that this one of the reasons the Soviet Union fell was exactly this. In America, we don't like people hacking into our systems, but we still keep creating, we keep training young people to run computers. We let them experiment with computers. We let them have computers and we maintain these great phone lines, of course, across which signals can go. The Soviet Union couldn't chance any of that. Their fear was not people hacking into the system. It was people hacking out. Mm -hmm. Because what if they reached out and touched America and found out what was really going on in America? Which is the exact reason why Google is a banned site in China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, ca exactly. you can't just surf the internet. <laughs> No, no. And it was like that before Before there was an internet. You can't get out and we will tell you what we want to know. And so back to the guardians, I think the assumption here is that having grown up in this state, they don't know any other life. You have to plan on that because if they're getting magazines from Sparta, Athens, and Corinth <laughs> trying to advertise all kinds of luxuries, that's, that's self-defeating. We're already censoring mm -hmm. literature. I assume we're censoring mail. Or whatever would be the equivalent in that culture that would let other people know, hey, they've got some pretty cool stuff going on in Corinth. You might want to go check. No, 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 no. All you know about Corinth is that they're poor, illiterate, and the enemy. That's it. We have to, we have to keep a lid on this. Now, that brings us to um, wives. And children. And here's where it gets really complicated. And, and even after I have it fresh in my mind, I can't always remember the details. So maybe feel free to jump in and correct me or <laughs> supplement. But the idea is that we do want to have the genetically, he doesn't say genetically, but that's what he means. Smartest, fastest, strongest. Um, marry with the smartest, strongest, fastest. Uh, and, and thus produce seed of that nature. And this will be our stock. But the problem is that some of the women are going to be more desirable at some level, more beautiful. Maybe they should just beat you up on the uh, gymnasium floor, um, you know, whatever. And, and people are going to, the, the, the young men are going to want quite a few women. So how do you handle that? You, you can't really, the whole point is that they work together. You can't really keep the men and women apart and only let the handsome men see the handsome women. It's, although that would probably work as well as what he actually suggests. <laughs> uh, he does suggest that all, all of the men and the women who are athletes are to be exercising together. Yes. Um, just as you would have both your male dogs and your female dogs out on your right. hunting trip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course. So the solution is... We're going, we're going to lie again. We're going to tell them that every man has a chance to be with every woman. And, but it's going to be arranged by lottery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he, he even suggests a, a little machine, not unlike our gumball machines or one of the older bingo or our election things. machines. Yeah, our election <laughs> machines, <laughs> yes. Might get canceled, you're saying, in this context, but mostly. <laughs> Um, and they will be rigged. 
but the the guardians won't know that. Everyone will believe everything's fair yep. and above board. And so they the can only curse their darn luck if yeah, they don't get what they want. Yeah, I, I, I've been trying to get with Susie for you know six years now, and it always comes up. You know, Claudia instead. <laughs> I just have the rottenest luck, I guess. Because you, because once they you tell them no, this is being done to you deliberately, you got problems. Now, children will be conceived, not necessarily every time, but often enough. Then now becomes the question of, well, what aren't they? If the guardian's going to be interested in these children, won't they stake claims on the ones they perceive to be theirs? Well, if we have the mating take place at particular times then the children will be born all at the same time. I'm going to take those children, we're going to put them in a state nursery. I believe he uses the word a pen, like mm -hmm. for pigs. Yeah. Um, <sighs> and and you're, they're not going to have much contact with them. We'll, we'll appoint nannies and nurses by the state who will feed and clothe and train these children. And the parents can come by now and then. And but all what they'll be met with is all of these children who were born about the same time and who apparently won't look too terribly different from everybody else. And they're all your children. And they'll all call you mom and dad or aunt and uncle. And you call them all sons and daughters. And so you are now invested in all of the children not just the ones that biologically you know to be yours. And they, in turn, are invested in you. And you're going to keep on doing this with um, in, in tune to some kind of liturgical calendar where we'll celebrate some god or something, and those will be the days when we'll let the men and women breed and the children be conceived, and, the, you know, we, and we'll keep it on a fixed rhythm Mm -hmm. So that every, all you know is I probably had, a, well, I had a child in that generation someplace, but there were like 40 kids born. So I don't know. Uh, and so not only do I not have my own house or car or Rolex, I don't have my own kids. I don't have my own wife. And if I haven't already had sex with the women I'm interested in, I have good hopes I will one day because I trust the system. Uh, at what point are we supposed to get disgusted here and say, <laughs> why are we holding up this man as the champion of the good, the beautiful, and the just? Because clearly he's joking, Greg. This is too ridiculous. <laughs> he can't possibly mean it. That's great. The question becomes is what <laughs> why did he does, say it? <laughs> why did he say it? What does it mean? Yeah. Um Well, it's as you've been talking, it reminds me of the fact that his system has been with some variations asserted, repeated, um, over and over and over again. And I think mm -hmm. it is an example of humanistic wisdom in the sense of if you are going to control people and make your state supreme, this is how you do it. You detach them from every root mm -hmm. that they would otherwise have. You detach yeah. them from God. You put God far away. You detach them from education of the world around them. You detach them from the family, from their children. And it's just been a, what do you call it? Wash, rinse, repeat um, mm. in lots of different in the actual book Utopia and other dystopian novels, plus what we've seen in Marxism, socialism. Uh, it actually even reminds me of something I, I studied in the Ottoman Empire, where they would pull out a group of young Christian men and brainwash them into being uh, Islamic soldiers for, mm. the, um, for the sultan. And they were to know nothing but the state. And it, it's just, so as I've been listening to, I'm thinking, yeah, if you, if you want to control people, <laughs> the state is your means. And these are all the methods. Cause you gotta, you gotta disconnect them from everything. And then they have nothing but to trust and believe you. Yeah. It's like an abusive situation. Yeah. Like in Basically. the purest <laughs> sense, you are yeah. isolating them from everything except what you control. Mm hmm um, and um, speaking of dystopian novels, 1984 now comes to mind. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, so what's the point? Well, 1984 would tell us the point is the control. It's the power. It's the power to destroy a human soul and remake it in your image. It's not about luxury or, or lust or sex or wealth. 
It's simply about the power to terrorize and destroy. And that the thirst for that is unending. And it's frightening. 1984, in many respects, is a faithful retelling of Plato's Republic, just with greater technology. And the more the technology increases, the more we think of, what? Well, wait, it was ridiculous then, but look what we could do now. Let's not do that, please. Um, and then the problem's not in the technology. The problem is in the human soul. He was looking for justice. And at the end, he asked, well, did we find it? <laughs> um, what, what's, what's your take on his final solution, Emily? I don't think he's willing to answer that question. <laughs> hmm. Um, he he sort of segues into Greek cosmology, mm -hmm. um, which is a bit of an excuse. I think he he sort of talks about what what he posits as the nature of the final judgment and the fates, um, and this does tie in with his sort of fixation on music, mm -hmm. with the music of the spheres and the resonance of mm. the different spheres of which the universe is composed. Um, I think he's un fundamentally, I think that's basically my answer is that he's not willing to answer the question of whether he found justice or not, which is rather telling. I have uh, one or two lines here, what I wrote and what he wrote. Justice is the harmonious interaction of the social classes within the city state. That, but that begs the question. Yes, that's like saying justice is when people act justly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what by and what he's standard? Aware. He's aware that he's begging the question yeah. there. <laughs> it's very, very Just, obvious. Justice means doing one's own business, or miraculously, the citizens of each class doing the work appropriate to that class. And here's a quote Any meddling of the one with the other, or the change of one into the other, is the greatest harm to the state and may be most justly termed evil doing. On the other hand, when the traitor, the auxiliary, the guardian, each do their own business, that is justice and will make the city just. And we're back to, and by what standard? Um, how? Why? What? what do you, yeah, it sounds like there's something there, but there's not. Why should they do their own business? Who defined their own business? Well, you did when you created the city state, I suppose. Does that mean that every person at some point in their life, presumably when they're quite young, is given a badge or a tag or a number that says, you are worker 604. You are assigned mm. to being You're a tailor. Pottery. You're a cobbler. Yeah. And uh, it is a transgression of divine justice to be yeah. otherwise. And again, we're back to Brave New World where it's all done by genetic engineering, but it's the same thing. Well, who decided? The planners did, and it's, the, again, as you say, the deep state, the planners behind the guardians. There's there's an old phrase, I forget uh, which, I assume it was a Roman writer, said, who watches the watchmen, or who guards mm -hmm. the guardians? And that's a real question. Who's behind all this? This is, his, this is what he finally says. Until philosophers are kings, or the kings and princes of this world have the spirit and power of philosophy, and political greatness and wisdom meet in one, and those commoner natures who pursue either to the exclusion of the other are compelled to stand aside. Cities will never have rest from their evils. No, no, they're human races, I believe. And then only will this our state have a possibility of life and behold the light of day. This is kind of the, the peak of the discourse, I think, is yeah. where, where Plato is saying, you know, who really should be running this is the philosophers. Right. You know, surprise, surprise. No. Um, they will know best. Right. <laughs> and he, you know, I think it's book six, I want to say, um, where he, yeah, book six, where he defines the nature of a philosopher and describes what that what the philosopher is like. And uh, boy, good luck finding one in real life, by the way. <laughs> uh, to bring this back to the semi-real world, if one is able to find the proper historical writers in the proper 
original texts, it's not that hard to trace this kind of thinking through the years that led, well, led out of the late Middle Ages through the Renaissance into the Enlightenment and then to the French Revolution. This esoteric, there are smart people who know stuff and they should plan experts. the world. The experts. Uh, the word technocrat hadn't been invented yet, but that's what it'll <laughs> become in the 20th century. Uh, originally, it was the philosophers. Uh, Danton, um, Robespierre, that whole, the, their ilk, all of that, they weren't from the lower classes. They were from the upper middle or lower upper classes. They were people who were university trained. They were people who were wrapped up in journalism and in the secret societies at Honeycomb France at the time. They thought in terms of transcendental, well, we would say myths, but to them, truth. From the Rosicrucians to the Freemasons to the Illuminati on, there is this ongoing we are the people who know really cool stuff. We should run the world. But because if we came out and told you that, you wouldn't like it. We're just going to kind of kiss up to the sons of the rich and powerful and tell them, tell these stupid jocks or <laughs> uh, money horses how to use their money and power. And they'll never notice that we're the ones pulling the strings. And this leads us into the 20th century. Um, there's a lot of fear in Christian circles and conservative circles about conspiracies and conspiracies behind conspiracies and the great conspiracy and all of that. But there is really a habit within the human mind to say, I'm smart, but I could never beat up anybody. I will use my smartness to get, the, uh, to get other strong people who trust me to do the beating up for me. It'll be great. It's not much different from a playground at this point, mm -hmm. um, but it, it is a common theme. Um, and so people worry about the Illuminati or the Freemasons or whatever. They're just people. They're, they're people who think that they know stuff or that they're not going to admit they don't. Sometimes it's about UFOs or Ascended Masters or who knows what, international bankers. <laughs> These are the people who know stuff. And if, just a quick um, glancing over the 1940s, 50s, and 60s from Roosevelt on. We have brain trusts. We have eggheads. We have um, people with university degrees who hang about the presidents and advise them and tell them how to make the world work. And no one stops and asks, why are you listening to these people? Well, they're smart. Um, can we define smart, please? Uh, the Bible says it begins with the fear of God. It says it involves keeping his commandments. And there's none of this here. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all illusion. It's all what we get in Plato. And that Christians had not figured this out, to me, of late, you may have noted, has become very <laughs> frustrating because, you know, we, we get our kids through Christian high school and send them off to Christian colleges oftentimes where they are taught Plato and Aristotle as if this is some great Christian discovery. Um, we, we do our best to inoculate them against that, but it is so pervasive. You want to, you want to be an intelligent Christian, then you need to study Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. Um, they will tell you about the good, the true, and the beautiful. Because they were, they were almost Christians because they were rational. Okay, they weren't rational. They were rationalistic. There's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see. Let's see the things we can chalk up to um, to Plato. I made a list here. I think I'll find it now. In the name of uh, social harmony, he called for conspiracy and deceit, the abolition of marriage among the elite, state-controlled nurseries, and the destruction of eugenically inferior children. This is wisdom. This is the just and the beautiful. Christians need to stop listening to this garbage. Christians, for one, honestly need to read Plato. I've been mm -hmm. I've been asked before. In fact, I've been there was one particular pastor who accused me of assigning wicked books to my students. <laughs> um, I, I was a little confused at the time. I think I finally figured out what he meant. You're assigning books not written by Reformed Presbyterian Christians. 
okay, well, first of all, most of our clientele doesn't come from that sector of the church anyhow. Um, we assign the Bible, strangely enough. But yes, we do assign some books written by our enemies so that you can, our students can see them while we're around to say, look, this is unbiblical. Look, this is ungodly. Look, this is stupid. Well, you're there to shine the light of scripture yeah, on their we're lives. we're there to shine scripture <laughs> on them. Um, I actually had one young man, a very fine young man, and I was impressed that he actually did come to me. He came with his mom, and I suspect because his pastor was the pastor in question. I said, why are you having us read um, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time? Well, it's culturally significant. It was a good introduction to what philosophers and astrophysicists are thinking. And I would rather have you read it now here while I'm around to answer questions than to run to it the first time in university. You need to know what the enemy's thinking. His mom accepted that as a good answer, and I think he did. Um, but it was interesting, that same kind of... We, we're not going to read anything that disturbs us. Yeah, until you get to college. You are going to college, aren't you? Most of them do. And so what are they going to find there? Who are they going to listen to? I've told my students again and again over the 40 years I've been teaching now, I don't want you to believe things because I say them, because when you get to college, you're going to find someone who's a lot smarter, more charismatic, better looking, more entertaining than I am. And if you believe stuff just because I said, you're going to believe them just because I say you need to be able to measure this against the Word of God. And so if we do have any university professors or bureaucrats listening, <laughs> are the things you're teaching actually taken from Scripture or is Scripture an add-on afterwards? Does Scripture, you think, give you permission to go romp around in pagan thought and bring it back into the church and feel content? because? Well, these men were smart and classical, there's that word, and uh, nearly Christians anyway. Read what they wrote. It's abominable. It's horrifying. And um, we haven't even yet got to the fact that Socrates and Plato both had sexual proclivities that would horrify us. But that's for another day. Yeah, the time has flown today. I. The time did not fly when I was reading Plato's Republic <laughs> this week. Mm. Um, but I will make that my recommendation for this evening is read P Plato's Republic. Um, it is more tolerable early on when you can pretend that you're reading Oscar Wilde instead. <laughs> um, and the sort of uh, cattiness in the dialogue is a little mm. bit less tiresome. Mm -hmm. And the further you go, the more you just skip Glaucon's lines, <laughs> as I said, it's um, it's tedious, but it is worth reading to know what it actually says. I was surprised with this read through of how how much of what I know of Plato, you know, what he's known for, the forms, the Platonic right. ideals, um, and as well as the things that are, you know, the allegory of the cave is in here. This is the source for a lot of what we know about Plato. Right. Um, so if you're just going to read one thing by Plato, this is pretty representative, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's my recommendation. It's kind of um, dull in that it is relevant to our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Um, Rachel, you got one? Sure. Uh, so <laughs> I have been on a bit of a podcast kick. So I have another podcast to recommend. Uh, this one is called the Off Code Podcast, hmm. and it is by Monique Dussan and uh, Kevin Briggins. They're from the Center for Biblical Unity, and they this podcast is both of them who are um, from the Black community, taking on the Black community with biblical truth hmm. to try to throw out, get rid of all the stuff that that community has bought into that is false and harmful to them and unbiblical. Uh, so they, the particular episode I want to recommend they did a couple weeks ago, and it's what are we actually celebrating on Juneteenth, mm. which is a thing I know very little. I, I mean, I knew the basic historical, but I didn't really know anything else. 
And so it was interesting to listen to them talk about it and say, we didn't grow up celebrating this. (laughs) It was a Texas thing (laughs) uh, because it happened in Texas. (laughs) And, but the, the, I guess the thing that instigated that podcast is Kevin, uh, he had posted a picture of Abraham Lincoln on Juneteenth and said, happy Juneteenth and got completely clobbered for posting a picture of a white guy on a black holiday. Hmm. And so they were discussing (laughs) how do we call it a black holiday? And yet President Biden made it a national holiday. How are we supposed to celebrate it? What are we celebrating? What's actually going on here? Um, So it was very interesting to to hear their take on it because I had just had a passing knowledge of it and um, didn't even know it had been made an official national holiday. Mm -hmm. So... I recommend that for more information on that holiday. Neat. Mm. Greg? Um, I'm going to recommend a book I probably recommended a long time ago in some other connection. It's uh, Rushis J. Rush Juni's The One and the Many. Mm. It is a discussion, you guessed it, of the problem of the one and the many, <laughs> but it is cast in the form mostly uh, of a history of philosophy. Uh, beginning with um, the chaos uh, order dialectic of the of Mesopotamia on through Greece, Rome, on into the future, ending with uh, Dojavir and Van Til. Uh, it, it is uneven in quality, but where it's good, it's great. And some of the things that he says about Greek philosophy and the Greek worldview are so on point. Uh, and if you're just trying to, if you're a Christian, you're just trying to get oriented toward philosophy. It's a pretty good place to start. Again, there are some things where, unless you you already have some kind of background, you might get a little lost. You can just skip that part. But he again and again points out, and this is unbiblical, and this is man making himself God, and this is a rejection of divine revolution, and so on. Uh, it is uh, thoroughly reformed, Calvinistic, covenantal, and um, presuppositional. And most of it is, if you have a college education, read it. Mm-hmm. If you don't, it's not a bad book to have around and, and poke around in and see what you can read. Um, as I say, a good part of it, it will be, you will find accessible. And lots of footnotes and lots of quotes. So things to pursue. There's something I need to recommend sometime, pursuing footnotes, but we'll save that mm-hmm. for another day. First of all, they should be footnotes. They should not be endnotes because ah, nobody's going to yes. flip to the end of the book. No. Don't put in endnotes. Nobody wants mm. them. Um, <laughs> I, I do flip to the end of the book and it irritates me trying to flip back and forth. Yes. Mm-hmm. You yeah, have to have I, a whole I, extra I will bookmark. go there. I just resent it the whole time. Yeah. It just makes me angry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I resent the knowledge that I'm gaining when I do so. Um, but if you want your people to actually, if you want your readers to actually check your work, which would be, you know, the intellectually honest thing for you Mm -hmm. to want. You should put them at the bottom of the page. Um, Yeah, I will say for uh, the one in the many, I read this uh, the spring and summer before I started college. Mm. um, And it was a really good time to have read it because then when I took history classes, history of philosophy classes, um, I would always like get this weird bell ringing in the back of my brain. Like I've seen this name before. Why have mm-hmm. I seen this name before? And I would go and look it up in the one and the many, um, which was, it's fun. You know, it's, it's a survey book. So it's, it's, there's not a whole lot of detail about mm-hmm. any one person, but it's a good, as you say, orienting resource. Yeah. I, I concur with that recommendation. <laughs> all right. And uh, that is all the time we have for tonight. So thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Big thank you to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling. We appreciate you and the editing software that you provide that saves David loads of time and makes us sound nice. Um, Big thank you also to our transcriptionist who donates her time to supply transcriptions that you can receive in your email if you like by subscribing to our Substack. Um, I think you would just Google halting towards Zion Substack. Um, as I think I've said before, I've never gone looking for a Substack. I've always, they just have come to me. Um, so if, if that's the thing you want delivered to your inbox and why not, go check that out. Um, big thank you also to you for listening. We appreciate you. Uh, go ahead, 
like, subscribe, share, share verbally with people who you know in real life. Thank you so much. Bye.